Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plotcast. Before we get started, I wanted to make sure you knew that Douglas Wilson has written a book for kids called Andrew and the Fire Drake. The boy Andrew can't remember who or where he is, but he does know that he has a task to do, and it's very important he completes it exactly the way he was instructed, no matter who or what tells him otherwise. At every step of his quest, Andrew is faced with a choice. Will he do what he knows he must, or will he take a shortcut? He will meet new friends, bitter enemies, and some who are a little bit of both, as he discovers his story is at once stranger and more magical than he thought. You can find Douglas Wilson's Andrew and the Fire Drake at canonpress.com. You can also listen to it exclusively on the Canon app. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 191. I'm Douglas Wilson. Uh, good to have you here. This is the podcast 191. So I want to talk a little bit about how written constitutions work, how written constitutions work. If we were to, a lot of Christians are snarled up on the question of Romans 13 because they assume quietly that the supreme authority in any system of governance would be the chief executive. So uh, there, this is um, devolving back to uh, the days of monarchy, and more than that, to sort of a divine right of kings uh, monarchy, where the, the king was the unquestioned uh, authority. It's ultimately pagan, where you, th- you believe that the instantiation of the will of God on earth is found in the king. Well, the problem with that is in our system of government, in in American civics, the supreme law of the land is the Constitution. The supreme law of the land is the Constitution. Now, someone's going to say, yes, but someone's got to interpret the Constitution. Someone's got to apply it, right? Someone's got to apply it. And in our system, that's the Supreme Court, right? The Supreme Court decides what the Constitution says. No, not exactly, not quite. And here's, here's how it works. There's a reason for having a written constitution. The reason for uh, the constitution is not a black box that the political engineers are in charge of and they keep in a back room somewhere. The constitution is written down in the common language, is uh, distributed among the people, is available on web- websites. And in the old days, they used to teach it in schools. So you have this written constitution, and it's written so that everybody can see. All right? So let's, uh, just for the sake of illustrating this, suppose everyone acknowledges on all hands that the constitution is the supreme law of the land, which, for example, the Idaho constitution expressly says. The Idaho Constitution uh, says that Idaho is a part of the Union and that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Now, let us suppose, and again, again, this is just for the purpose of illustration, let us suppose that there's a Supreme Court decision that says that a state can be represented by three senators. The Constitution says that each state will be represented by two senators But let's say the Supreme Court says that two in this instance means three. So two senators can be interpreted if you uh, understand the Constitution as being a living document and malleable and stretchy. That means that two senators can mean three senators. Now, what what does this do to a literate public? Everybody's looking at the Constitution. They've got a copy of it. They pull it up online, or they pull a little pocket constitution out of a desk drawer somewhere, and they, f- they read through it, and they see that the constitution expressly says that each state is going to be represented by two senators, but the Supreme Court has just said three senators. Now, I've got two documents in front of me. You know, here I am, Joe Citizen, out here. I've got two documents in front of me. One document is the constitution. 
which is acknowledged on all hands as being the supreme law of the land. And I've got a Supreme Court decision which says that the supreme law of the land actually meant to say three, but they accidentally said two or some other convoluted piece of reasoning. Now, you might say, well, this is just absurd. You've got, uh, this is an absurd piece of reasoning because nobody's ever going to say that two is, they're never going to turn two into three. Well, they're turning the right to keep and bear arms into not having the right to keep and bear arms. They're turning free speech into not having the right to free speech. They're turning free assembly into not having the right to free assembly and so on. I don't know why on earth they would limit themselves to those activities and not arrogate to themselves the right to change two into three, right? We're dealing with this very issue as we're considering all of these things. Now, I'm looking at it and it says two. I'm, I'm just Joe Citizen. I look at it and it says two. The governor of my state looks at it and he says, oh, it says two. The uh, Congress, the Senate, and the House say, oh, it says two. Let's say the president says, it says two, but the Supreme Court says three. Now what? Well, the Constitution says what the Constitution says, regardless of any usurping power grab that is um, being undertaken by the Supreme Court trying to reinterpret this thing. So, how many senators does each state have? Well, constitutionally, each state has two senators. And if they succeed in pulling the wool over everybody's eyes, if they succeed in actually getting each state to send three senators, and they do so for a generation, the Constitution still says two. What they're doing is illegal. Now, it's unconstitutional. Now, what's actually happening is a coup d'etat, where the, what they are doing is they are treating the Constitution, I think Joe Sobrin once used this illustration, they're treating the Constitution as the queen mum of American politics. She doesn't have any power, doesn't have any authority, but they trundle her out on the balcony to wave at the crowds on the 4th of July. Look, look at our Constitution. Well, in this case, if it were at that point, what they'd be doing is not trundling out a, a frail queen mum, but rather a queen mum who has been stuffed by a taxidermist, where uh, she's wheeled out on the, pla on the balcony and says, everybody, here's your Constitution, the supreme law of the land. But the point of a written constitution was to provide accountability. In other words, if it were all in a black box and the rulers went into the back room and then they came out every spring and told us how many senators we were going to have, that would be one. If that were our system of government, it'd be bad and demented, but at least it would be not dishonest the way they're doing it now. As long as they say, that the Constitution is the supreme law, uh, law of the land, and as long as I can read, I will believe, if I continue to regard the activities of third senator as highly illegal, criminal, unconstitutional, wicked impudence, when I look at that, I am not, and, and say things like that, and object to things like that, and continue to protest, I am not violating Romans 13. I'm objecting to their violation of Romans 13, all right? So that's the baseline. Now, let's make it a little more, just a, a little more practical. Using the example of two and three senators is difficult because I might not have any control over what my state sends to Washington and what gets seated there in Washington. But let's say, let's take it down to something in the Bill of Rights, the, the right to um, assemble or the right to keep and bear arms. Let's say we get to the decision where they say the right to keep and bear arms means that you don't have the right to keep and bear arms. Now, if I discover that all my firearms were lost in a boating accident, maybe, oh, must have been five years ago, and I actually keep my firearms hidden at some secure location at my house, if I do that, am I violating Romans 13? No. I'm being uncooperative while other people are trying to conspire together with me to violate Romans 13. The bad guys come up to me and say, hey, Joe Citizen, let's together conspire to violate the existing authorities that God has established. And I say, no, I don't want to participate. 
I don't want to violate Romans 13. Ironically, if I keep my guns, there are many Christians who will accuse me of violating Romans 13. So we continue on with uh, podcast episode 191, and we come now to hamartiology. As you know, this is our hamartiology segment in which we are studying the sins of the New Testament. The word this time around is diacrino, diacrino, D-I-A-K-R-I-N-O, diacrino. And it has a range of meanings, some of them sinful and some not. So a lot of the words in the New Testament that represent sins, the, uh, the word, <laughs> every instance of the word points to a sin. This word is not like that. For example, it can mean judge, as in 1 Corinthians 6.5, and it's innocent, it's entirely lawful use there. The Corinthians were expected to be able to judge their own troubled situations in the church. In other situations, it can mean doubt, but not in the sinful sense. Peter is told to go with the messengers from Cornelius, nothing doubting. That's in Acts 10.20, and in Acts 11.12, in the next chapter when he's recounting what happened. So, when, when Peter, if Peter were to doubt the veracity of these messengers, it's, it wouldn't necessarily be a sin. And he's told to go, uh, nothing doubting. Now, uh, that said, we then come to the kind of doubting which is plainly sinful. This is when a person is doubting in those situations where he should not be doubting. For example, Romans 14, 23, and here's our word, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, in this case, the sin is a combination of doubting and pressing through the doubts anyway instead of resolving them. It's fine to have doubts about whether this thing here is lawful and then study it and resolve the issue in your mind and heart and conscience, and then go on and do it. But it's another thing entirely to have all kinds of scruples yelling at you about whether or not it's lawful to do this, and you just grit your teeth and do it anyway. That person is condemning himself. He, uh, he that doubteth is damned or condemned if he eat, because he eat, he's not eating from faith. So th- this is a combination of pressing through while doubting. But for the sinful element to come explicitly, we can look at how James puts it. Our translators rendered the word here in James as wavering. There's a couple of, couple of instances of it, both in one verse. In James 1.6, it says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. That's our word there, diacrino. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So, being double-minded, being unstable in all your ways, going back and forth, um, not being able to make up your mind, that kind of doubting is sinful. And then, of course, we have the Lord's teaching on the subject. He puts it this way. This is from Matthew 21, 21, but there's also a parallel passage in Mark eleven twenty three. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. So, Jesus is saying, if you have faith and you don't doubt, and of course, it is um, a grace to have faith, and if you have doubts instead of faith in this sense, then that would be, be a sin. So, we're still in episode 191 of uh, the podcast, and uh, we come now to my book review portion. And this is a little bit of an odd book review, but why should we let that stop us? I'd like to just give a few words of encouragement to you to read the Apocrypha sometime. Many of you have Bibles in your homes that have the Apocrypha bound with the Bible. And the one I just read was uh, bound together with the New English Bible. So I've read the Apocrypha a couple, well, three times now, but a couple of times years ago. And then uh, Nancy and I have a time in the morning where we, where we read, a, well, generally, usually read scripture and then uh, some instruction, you know, a Puritan or something. And um, so she has her prayer time and Bible reading time, and I've got mine. 
separately, but we also have time together. And during this uh, time together, this last, uh, this last go-round, we read the Apocrypha, the New English uh, Bible version of the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha is, I would argue, and uh, it's very, very valuable for believers to uh, be familiar with. There are some parts of the Apocrypha when you're reading through. You will be v- very grateful as you read that our Protestant forefathers saw fit not to include this in the Bible, <laughs> not to consider it canonical, not to consider it inerrant. You would basically the a staunch inerrantist is going to have trouble with the Apocrypha. Is going to have trouble explaining some of the blunders or mistakes that are 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 there. At the same time. There's some good history and good background and good information. And so the Apocrypha is basically was accepted by the Jews of the dispersion and was included in the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew. And in Palestine, where they spoke Aramaic, which is a dialect form of Hebrew, Aramaic is called Hebrew by the New Testament, in the New Testament. The um, Palestinian Jews, used the Hebrew Old Testament, which does not have the Apocrypha in it, and the Septuagint did. When Christianity spread out into the uh, Roman world, a lot of the Gentile converts knew Greek and not Hebrew, so when they went to get their hands on a Bible, they'd pick up a Septuagint, which the writers of the New Testament frequently quote and and use. And the the copy of the Bible that they would pick up would have the Apocrypha in it, which is what created the problem. So, um, the, which what that's what created the question. So, when Jerome, the one who translated um, scripture into Latin, he considered the books um, of suspect provenance, and for a long time they've been considered deuterocanonical, like um, they're canonical but on the back of the bus. And then Protestants consider them not canonical but worth reading. And that's what I'm commending to you now. Not canonical, not to be considered as scripture, but worth reading. There's some things, uh, there there are books of uh, wisdom literature, Ecclesiasticus and uh, wisdom, Sirach. Then you've got books of history like uh, first and second Maccabees, and then fables like fables or legends like uh, Judith or Tobit. And it's all interesting. But some of the things that are described there are touched on in the New Testament. So, for example, it, Protestants shouldn't sneer at the, at the Apocrypha. It should be read for edification, like you would pick up a good Christian book at, at a Christian bookstore and read it that way, read it, read it at that level. There are sections in the New Testament that, that refer to, to events in the Apocrypha. So, for example, um, in Hebrews 11, where it talks about women, people accepting torture, looking for a better resurrection, that's a reference to Maccabees, something out of the, the history of the Maccabees. So, it doesn't take that long. Yeah, just chip away at it. I would encourage you to sit loose in the saddle, relax, have fun, read the Apocrypha.